Hi. Um, so, th things. Things get complex. Um, in early Unix, the, uh, the init program was like three, four hundred bytes. And what happened over the next few decades, you know, it's like there's init, there's init.d, there's rc.d, there's rc, there's inetd, xinetd, system starter, atd, cron.d, watchdog.d, this.d, that.d. Um, and then Apple did something cool in OS X, which is that they, they consolidated a lot of these and they just had one D called launchd. And um, most people know what it is. If you use Mac OS X, if you use Tiger or Leopard, or if you use an iPhone, uh, LaunchD is running most of the time. Um, and who better to talk about LaunchD than the person who created it? So um, I'm very glad and happy to have Dave Zardeshki amongst us today. He's the guy who wrote LaunchD. He works at Apple. And he would tell us about uh, you know, what LaunchD is, why he did it, or you know, whatever else you might want to know. So let's welcome Dave. All right, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about LaunchD and managing processes with it. But first, I want to talk about the big picture and kind of what led to LaunchD at Apple. So we're Apple. We've got some goals. We have a culture. We try and create products that people want to use. And we've got a wide spectrum of products. We're not just looking to create computers like what we have here. You know, they're general purpose, can do just about anything you want. We have very embedded devices. We have the phone, we have the TV. And to that point, only one of these has terminal. Well, two out of these have a shell. But in the long run, probably that computer is going to be the only thing left with a terminal and a shell. The rest of these are much tighter knit, um, a much more controlled circumstance. But you really got to begin to ask yourself, what's a Unix? And what's an operating system? If, you know, how do you define it? Is it the APIs? Is it the user experience? Who knows? You can call those all Unix, or you can call one of them Unix. But I'm going to talk about how LaunchD plays into all of them. So we have some design goals. We have some very interesting design goals. Design goals that weren't like your old mainframes. Namely, we don't want to restart any application or any computer after a configuration change. Yeah, Unix people, like, no, we've got a server. It never reboots. Not at Apple. We've got a plan on uh, applications dying, and we need to be able to deal with that. Plus, you know, if you change IP ad addresses, not such a scary concept these days, but, you know, 10 years ago, a lot of software would have to be rebooted if you changed an IP address. Not so much these days. We have some other goals, though. In particular, we're always pushing everybody at Apple to write more dynamic software. We have hot plug hardware these days. We have wireless hotspots. And we, we all want them to be user friendly. And I picked the Airport Express, one of our products, to exemplify this. This is both a uh, wireless base station and it's a device as far as the iTunes MP3 player is concerned. I, iTunes finds it and allows you to play audio through it. But it all does it seamlessly through the UI. But another uh, thing that we have to worry about, we have multi-core CPUs. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to best take advantage of them. And some of it will be done at a very academic CS level, but a lot of what we deal with isn't academic. And we're trying to design a system that can deal with the actual functional things that an operating system does and deal with, add more concurrency there. Another challenge that we have, and I'm going to pull up one of our web pages here, is we need to work in low memory scenarios. This may seem like a lot, 512 megabytes, but what you need to realize is there are a few thousand developers at Apple. There are thousands upon thousands of developers outside of Apple, and we have to share all that. And when you start doing the math, you're like, wow, OK. Each one of us gets a little section to play with and if we don't want a page. Well, LaunchD helps improve the situation, too, by only running software when you need it. And we'll talk about that more later. Now, what are some obstacles we face in trying to make a much more dynamic and robust system? Well, the same goal that we have is actually a challenge. Life is more dynamic. The problem with uh, a lot of the software that people have written in the past is they make assumptions. And for some people make them pervasively. And uh, we continue to push people inside the company and outside the company to make less assumptions. And when you make less assumptions, your software is A, more reliable, and your customers are happier. Now, we also push people to be more event-driven. 
This not only improves concurrency, but this improves robustness. You can't always anticipate what order events will occur in, so if you could just respond to them as they come in, your software will behave much nicer. And this is what we push people to do at, the, at Apple and outside the company, and <clears throat> this is how it's going. We also encourage people to be more flexible and error, make better error recovery. Again, on that assumption theme, if you build up assumptions, you're building up a house of cards. And with the house of cards, all it takes is like a little puff of error or something bad to happen, and the whole thing collapses. Nobody wants that. But it also improves the user experience. The more flexible your software is, the more you can deal with potentially unanticipated scenarios that your customers may encounter. But more than anything, we want to avoid this scenario. Nobody likes it when their computer goes down, especially catastrophically. So what did we do to accomplish our design goals? Well, one thing we did was this launch sheet project, which I'm going to talk about going into more depth. Launch sheet is actually really simple. I have two pictures to show you what I mean. It's a lifeguard. It, it watches a process. If it crashes, it restarts it. It's also a telephone operator. What it does is help processes find each other and communicate with each other. That's really it. In two things, this is what LaunchD does. Now, there's a lot of details in this, and you know, monitoring processes help them respond, acting as an uh, arbiter and, uh, of inter-process communication, but this is it in a nutshell. Now, in Leopard, our operating system soon to be released, LaunchD has been very successfully adopted. There are 166 LaunchD jobs in Leopard. And this isn't even talking about the phone or the TV or potentially other projects we have at the company or the server product. LaunchD is actually very well received, and this is understating how well it's been received at the company. In fact, it's being used at all layers of the operating system, from basic airport functionality, which many of you may think of as a driver, all the way up to X-Ray, which is our, one of our debugging tools for introspecting the behavior of an application. All of them are using LaunchD at some level. Now, why are we doing this? Why LaunchD? What is it getting us? Well, it's getting us false isolation and error recovery. What LaunchD allows us to do is divide more of the tasks that a computer is trying to accomplish into separate address spaces. And the more separate address spaces you have, the more fault isolation you can have. And on the error recovery side, LaunchD, like I said, with the lifeguard analogy, monitors a process, and if it dies, it restarts it. That's huge. If you look at System Starter or RC or a lot of these things, it's fire and forget. Hope for the best, and if something goes wrong, hopefully someone will get paged and reboot the computer. Launch deep? No. We'll just monitor them. We'll restart it. But going back to that multi-core theme, Launch is also getting us fully asynchronous bootstrap. Way more than the parallel startup you've seen with scripts. Launch D launches any process in any order. It doesn't matter, actually, with Launch D, and we'll go into why later. But this is huge on the multi-core systems. We can launch as much as possible and let the hardware and some of the lower level software sort out what needs to run and when. On the flip side, LaunchD encourages pay as you go. And I'll demonstrate this later. What it, LaunchD allows us to do is only run software when we need it. Nobody likes paying for bloat. Nobody wants to see that stuff in their, either their process output or their memory usage. Why should you pay for a feature you're not using? LaunchD makes it easy to pay as you go. And finally, on security, this is something I'm really happy about. We at Apple are using LaunchD to get rid of set UID. The whole concept, gone. Um, it isn't completely gone yet, but we've stemmed the tide of new set UID binaries. And the way we're doing this is through privilege separation. And the way we do that in LaunchD is you can have a process running in unprivileged space. And via LaunchD, and through the inter-process communication, that telephone analogy, we're making it possible for the unprivileged program to find the privileged program and have it do a special task. You can, this is really neat. Now we're allowing for privileged tasks to not necessarily be the kernel. It could be some daemon. And through inter-process communication, we can do privileged operations. So let's start going into depth. Less of these big picture things. Launch these open source. Apple really values what it's doing for the, the company so much so that we actually put it under the Apache license and made it open source. If any open source operating system would like to get some of the same benefits, we're happy to work with you and integrate LaunchD into your product. There's a URL right here where you can track the CV or SVN commits as they come. There's a few mailing lists. They're pretty low traffic. Uh, but if you have any questions or curiosities, that's the place to go. So what are we going to cover today? Well. 
we're going to cover some things for developers, like where does my code fit in? Or when does my code get invoked? Or how does my code resolve dependencies? Or how does my code check in with launch D? For sysadmins, we're going to cover why launch D is a good thing for you. Because it's not just all about developers. It's sometimes sysadmins do need to get involved. So fitting into Mac OS X, we have three basic layers in the operating system now. We have a per machine layer, a per session layer, and inside the per session layer, you'll find basic applications like Safari, our web browser, or iTunes, our MP3 player, or some processes you may not realize, like the system UI server, which presents things like in the upper right-hand menu where you have those menu links. We also have some per machine concepts, uh, things like our disk arbitration daemon for doing mounts when a disk is plugged in, or KexD when new hardware shows up, it finds the driver and loads it up into the kernel or configd, which monitors networking changes and configures the network for you. But we ha we've added a new layer in Leopard, and we're calling it the per machine context. And in this per machine context, we are anticipating processes that uh, fit in between here. So we have gssd, which helps manage uh, Kerberos credentials and get them in the kernel, but it acts on behalf of the user. We have the ccache agent, which manages and caches Kerberos credentials. Or we have things like the SSH agent, which is a, a, another uh, credential caching mechanism. And I'll get into more of what these layers mean later. These layers, though, have a relationship. In particular, when it comes to inter-process communication, here's what can happen. We have applications, we have agents, we have daemons. These applications can talk to each other either way, A to B, B to A. Agents can talk to each other, and daemons can talk to each other. The other thing that can happen is applications can talk to agents or daemons, or agents can talk to daemons. And there's a good reason for this, and I'd like to go into why. So why only downward IPC? Well, we have this machine layer, like we talked about. We have sessions. Oh, wait. We can have multiple, uh, sorry, per user context. We have Bob's background context and Sally's. There's more than one. In fact, um, we can have multiple sessions, too. We have GUI sessions. We have maybe command line sessions. We have yet untold sessions. Maybe they're FTP. Maybe they're X11. And what you see is the downward only IPC encourages well layering. The problem is if you're at a background layer, uh, not a background layer, if you're at any one of these lower layers and you're trying to communicate upwards, you have a question of which one thing you want to talk to. Do you want to talk to Sally's background program, or Sally's finder process, or web browser, or Bob's? Well, if people arrange their designs and their inter-process communication so they only communicate downward when they're asking for requests or help, it's very implicit which program you need to talk to. So that's what we encourage in the product. So to go into depth on these containers, we have per session. Every process that lives in here should, or probably, interact with the user. And these are programs that come and go with a session. So when you log in, the finder gets launched, or that's our file browser. And you probably want it to go away when you log out. So this is our per session context that we like to talk about. We also have the per user context that we've been describing. This is for programs that don't need to interact with the user and probably want to transcend login and log out. So let's say you wrote your own little personal web server and it's running on 8080. Well, you don't want that to go away when you log out but it's not necessarily the web server for everybody on the machine. What you can do is place this program in our per user context, and that's where it'll live. It'll get all the support services it needs, and you don't need to worry about login and logout. And finally, per machine. What we're really encouraging developers to do is run as little code in this layer as possible. It should be code that is only required to arbitrate or share hardware between users. And most developers seem to be uh, buying off on this concept. They understand the risk of operating at that layer, and they're trying to move their code upward in the stack. So let's get started. How would you use LaunchD? It's actually really simple. Apple has a property list concept. It's a standard way of representing basic CS types, be it uh, integers or dictionaries or arrays or strings. And you're going to place one of these configuration files in a well-known location. Apple has a pretty standard schema for that. 
Um, I'm going to go into some of the examples of that. We have library launch daemons, and these are per machine jobs installed by the sysadmin. Or we have system library launch daemons. These are machine-wide programs supplied by Apple. Now, in your home directory, you can have library launch agents. This is programs you want run for you, either as a part of your session or your background session. And they just apply to you and your context. But let's say you're a sysadmin and you want every machine on the network to have maybe iTunes launch. You could install a property list in network library launch agents. And now every machine on the network will pick that up and get that program running. Or maybe you want to limit the scope as a sysadmin. You could install a property list in library launch agents, which is just the local disk. These uh, configuration files will just be loaded up for each user on that machine. And finally, Apple, of course, supplies some launch agents. And you can find them on Leopard. And those are installed in system library launch agents. Now, what does this configuration file look like? It's actually really simple. There's three basic keys. You have a label, which is a unique identifier for a job, and it's uh, permanent. So unlike a PID, which is ephemeral, a label like com.apple.configd won't change, even though configd may crash and be restarted. You also need program arguments. And here's where I need to give an apology. Um, this is more confusing than it needs to be. It is a, I'm going to just read this off because this is the best I could do. A pre-tokenized array of strings that corresponds to the second argument of main, including argv0. That part trips people up. So maybe I should say that differently. This is the second argument of exec v, if you know Unix. The first argument will be inferred if it's not supplied via the program key. I'm really sorry this is more confusing than it needs to be. You can see the launch D and exec and man pages for more information. Uh, and finally, one last key on demand. Setting this to a false implies that the program should be kept alive indefinitely. Um, and this tells launch D to restart it. That's it. That's all you need to do to have a program on Mac OS X be kept alive as long as you want. So what does that look like in the real world? Well, this is what one of our property lists looks like. It's a twist on XML. We have a dictionary. And inside the dictionary, we have a label. And the, the, key, the, the value of this key in this example is com.example.hellod. This is the name we've given it. We have the program arguments. In this case, it's user sbin hellod. And finally, on demand false. This simple configuration file will keep hello D alive uh, on Mac OS X. Now, let's talk more about the schema. There are more keys than I could possibly talk about, and I don't want to put you to sleep. Uh, but to give you a few examples of other things you can do, let's look at, you can set the current working directory. You can set environment variables. You can set the program. Um, this is to skip path traversal or do funky tricks if you're a Unix expert. There's a username key. There's a start interval and start calendar interval keys. And for there's a limit load to session type if you only want the program scope to different kinds of contexts. So be it the, you know, when you're logged in at the GUI, that's the aqua context. You can say background for the, um, if you want it to transcend your session. And for those of you doing really funky things and you want a program to be running at the login prompt, you can say login window. And when I bring all this up, as a sysadmin, you should be saying to yourself, wow, this is actually kind of cool. We have a standard schema now for representing all the attributes of all the processes that are running that I might care about. So unlike a shell script where I might just have to grep for maybe the nice key, you know, nice command and hope for the best, or you know, CD and hope that you know, that isn't a part of some setup, but it's actually the ultimate working directory, that's just you know, hodgepodge. With LaunchD, now you have standard configuration file representing all the process attributes in a standard schema. It makes it very easy to search and change things uh, systematically. Now, dependencies. Dependencies is a topic that has come up time and time again. Uh, I'd like to go into them in depth right now and explain Apple's perspective on how they work. Dependencies, at its basic layer, are a contract. Programmers work with contracts. That's how we get our jobs done. There are two kinds of contracts. Um, one, programmatic, the one that most people are familiar with and they think about when they program because they're programmers. And these are every API you've ever used. But the one that we sometimes forget are the data-driven contracts. In fact, this is what LaunchD is all about. Every configuration file is a contract with LaunchD about what behavior you can expect. 
And how does this start manifesting itself? Well, let's talk about um, resolving some issues that average daemon writer might face. If you're worried about networking state, like when the network gets plugged and unplugged or what the IP address is when you boot up, we have an API framework, a library, called the System Configuration Framework. You can use that. You can uh, register APIs and find out when networking changes or what the current IP address is and resond, res respond to these events. And for disk changes, we have the disk arbitration framework. There you can find out when volumes are mounted, unmounted, and maybe do things with them. Or let's say device discovery. The goal here is, again, the IOKit framework. If you want to find out when the USB device is plugged in or a FireWire device or whatever, IOKit is the way to go to figure out when those devices show up and deal with them accordingly. So there's a trend here. If you want to find out what the state of the system is when you boot up, use a framework. That framework will not only tell you what the state is, but it'll tell you when the state changes. In fact, let's look at this even further. When a program in the old Unix world booted up, they declared what other programs they need. Well, that's really not the reality of the matter. What we have is a one-to-one -one correspondence between frameworks and processes. So on Mac OS X, a GUI app might use something called core services. And as a part of the implementation details of core services, they have a daemon called core services D. You could, again, look at the disk arbitration framework. It's not that a program that you write needs disk arbitration D. It doesn't. What it needs is a disk arbitration framework to figure out when these events happen and respond to them accordingly. We can keep going down the list. Some of these are slightly less obvious. Our core graphics library uses the process called the window server. Some core foundation uses disk node D. And the list goes on and on. The chief point here is the processes are an implementation detail. And what we encourage people to do is use frameworks or write them. So let's say you're writing one of these frameworks. All right, well, how do you <laughs> find your daemon now if we're going to start processes up fully asynchronously? Well, let's deal with a case example going back to the 70s. Classic API, get PW NAM or name or however you want to pronounce it, takes a login and it returns a structure to represent that login. Well, in the old days, it previously read Etsy password. And that file was there, just read it directly and got the results and gave it back to the application. But in Mac OS X, we've changed it so this API talks to directory services via inter process communication. So the question is, how did we avoid a race between a program calling that API and the directory services daemon being running and answering those queries? It's actually really simple. If we look at that standard plist again, except this time for directory services, they added a simple key value pair declaring what mock services they vend. They declared their name in the namespace. And the value in this case is true because that's all that's needed. But this is all they did. They said, hey, I'm directory services. Put my entry into the phone book, if you will. And that's the name in the phone book. And the way this works out is a contract, a contract between LaunchD and your program. And what we promise is race-free IPC setup. The way we do that is that all the jobs for a given context, let's say a daemon, um, will be loaded up in, into LaunchD before any one of them starts running. What that means is uh, this works for each layer. We, it works at the agent layer, the logger window, Aqua, or standard I.O., or works for background pro jobs, or the daemon jobs. Each layer is configured atomically. And once that's done, that means that a uh, sorry, um, once that's done, that means that any process starts up can find any other process, even if it's not running yet. It can find the IPC handle, start sending it messages. Those will get queued up until the daemon actually comes online and starts draining the messages. Well, on the flip side, what does LaunchD not promise you? Well, this goes back to that framework conversation. We don't promise any networking is configured. We don't promise any auxiliary file systems are mounted. In fact, not, we don't even promise that all the hardware is being done probed yet. Your daemon might be running before that point. In fact, nothing beyond the ability to do IPC is done. So what does this mean? Use frameworks and make less assumptions. You know, even servers these days are being more dynamic. 
people are maintaining thousands of servers all at once and they don't necessarily want to configure a file on them, they'd rather just assign them via DHCP. If you want to change that, you'd ideally just like to be able to go to your DHCP server and say this server's new IP address is this. And if the daemons on that machine can't handle that, that'd be really disappointing because you need to restart them manually. So, okay, we've been talking about IPC a lot. How do you actually talk with LaunchD to get your IPC handles so that you can actually start answering your queries? It's actually really simple. We have a basic boxed object APIs. To start with the first example, we have the ability to box up a C string into an object and we can extract it if we want. And we build on this. We have a check-in API so you can get your descriptors or your mock ports from LaunchD and start answering your queries from your customers, or your framework in this case. And this is how you do it. You create a new string with a magic uh, or well-known key called check-in, and then you lob it over at LaunchD via launch message. And LaunchD gives a response. If it gives null, then there was a communication failure with LaunchD. That's it. Send a message over, get a message back from LaunchD. And let's build on this a little bit more. And how do you tear apart that response and start communicating with your frameworks? Well, first we need to see if there's any secondary failures. Maybe we were able to talk to LaunchD, but maybe there was a failure in the request that we made. So we'll check at the type of the response. If it's an error no, then we extract it and explain why something went wrong. Um, and, and let's go to stage three. How do we actually iterate the data and get our descriptors? Well, we have a dictionary lookup API. We have a basic dictionary type. So we can take the response and say, hey, was there a timeout key in there, an advisory idle timeout if the daemon's not doing anything? Okay, great, let's use it. Uh, let's see if there were any mock services. Oh, great, the dictionary lookup succeeded. Let's iterate the results with a callback-based uh, API. And the same with sockets. We can look it up. We have a callback-based API that you can use the uh, launch data dict iterate. And let's show what that looks like. Dictionary iteration is really simple. You're going to get your callback called for each object in the dictionary. You'll get the key for the object. And you'll get the cookie passed in or the context or parameter or whatever, you know, something so you don't lose track of your state. And this just happens to print out the key, the pointer to the value, and the cookie. And with these basic APIs, you can start building the check-in. So you can find your descriptors, you can find your mock ports, and then start servicing them as a part of your event loop. So, talking to LaunchD. Okay, this is great. We've been describing the data-driven interface so far, but we haven't been talking about how you interface with it as a developer or as a sysadmin. We have a, sub, we have a command for doing that. It's called launchctl, and you can, as a list of subcommands. You can say list, for example, to list loaded jobs. It has load and unload for loading an individual configuration file or unloading it manually, and most of the time you won't need to do that but because the system loads them for you. But if you wanted to manually load and unload them, you can do that. You can tweak the level of verbosity that LaunchD sends to syslog via the log command. So log level debug is a very frequent example for just getting LaunchD to be very noisy about what it's up to. You can manually kickstart a job if you don't want to wait for your on-demand criteria to fire. Uh, and you can stop a job, which sends a sig term to whatever the PID happens to be at the moment. And finally, you can say export to get the environment variables that are loaded up in LaunchD. And last but not least, there's help to show you these and a few other oddball commands. Now, things we've added for Leopard, things that we're very happy about, mostly because we use them, but um, we have mock IPC now. So it doesn't matter whether your program, your daemon, your agent, whatever, uses mock or Unix. Both of them work with LaunchD now, and either event can cause the program to run. This whole agent and uh, background context, we've added that. So now you can have these programs work at more than just the daemon layer. And finally, we've added conditional keep alive logic that some of you may appreciate. And we'll give three examples. So keep alive is a simple key you can add to your dictionary. It's the opposite of the on-demand truth. Uh, one, and in fact, it replaces it. So if you say keep alive true, that's the same as on demand false. Um, but given this is a boxed object type system, we can change the value from a Boolean to a dictionary and start doing interesting things. So in this case, with keep alive, we have, uh, 
a few examples. We have successful exit. Maybe you want a program to run as long as it keeps failing, but the second it succeeds, we want to stop running it. Um, so this is what that says. You can read it like so. Keep alive as long as the program's successful exit state is false. So that means that as long as the program keeps failing, we'll keep running it. You could do the inverse by setting successful exit to true, which means as long as this program exits zero, we'll keep it alive, but the minute it crashes, we'll stop res respawning it. Uh, another example is network state. Mind you, network state's fairly ambiguous, um, so I don't necessarily advise using this key, but you can still play with it. Uh, network state keeps the program alive, in this case, as long as the network is up for some definition of up. Um, if you wanted to do the inverse, maybe if the network goes down, which means essentially no interfaces are configured, you could say network state false. Uh, and finally, one that people actually are using, and I encourage people to use at Apple, is the pass state example. What this allows us to do is dynamically, on the fly, as the file system changes, keep programs alive or uh, based on whether a file is there or not a file, a path. A path exists or is missing. So in this case, what this says is, please keep this program alive as long as the following path state, uh, etsy-example.conf, exists. Maybe, and this is a common paradigm that's showing up in Leopard now. So we can have daemons that are configured to run when and if their configuration file exists. And this is very handy. It means that the minute the user configures something, maybe via GUI, and the file gets dropped down on the system, LaunchD notices and fires the daemon that reads that configuration file and takes action on it. You can also do the inverse if you want to do some kind of a semaphore mechanism. Maybe you can have one program run when a file's missing and another run when it exists. So these are three basic examples of conditional keep lives. Now, assumptions. We talked about these at the beginning. Sometimes you need to work around them. I'm going to show you a basic example using shell interpositioning with Apache. So Apache doesn't use the disk arbitration framework to find out when disks come online or not. And it probably doesn't use the system configuration framework to find out when uh, networking changes. So there are a few commands on the system to wait for uh, interesting conditions to happen. The system configuration framework team has been kind enough to provide a command that called ipconfig and they have a wait all subcommand. And what that does is it makes a best effort for some semblance of networking to be up and then it returns. Now mind you, a laptop like that can have networking come and go all the time, so we'd still encourage the use of the system configuration framework to monitor for those events. Another example of a quickie KQ command is wait for path. And what that does is monitor for mount table updates and essentially monitors the file system to figure out when that path comes online. Once it does, it returns. So at this point, if we were working with Apache and trying to work around some of the assumptions it made, you could use these two commands to wait for networking to be up for some definition of up, and you could wait for the document route to be online. Once that's true, then we exec Apache with whatever arguments were passed to us. So to rehash some of our goals and then get into a demo, we would like program authors to uh, recover from uh, errors more often, and LaunchD will help you even if your program catastrophically dies. We'd like you to use some of our frameworks to monitor for events, and preferably, if you can, launch on demand. And the way that's done is via the IPC that we've talked about. If you're a framework author, please uh, write a back-end helper process and use the IPC fe features we provided. This is what will allow you to launch on demand and pay as you go. And now I'd like to get into some demonstrations about how we've integrated basic Unix technologies with, some, with LaunchD and launching on demand. So let's see. I need to turn on mirroring. Just All right. So to demo what's going on here, I'm going to show off SSH agent, a very common SSH command, launching after uh, SSH. So uh, if we look, we see that the agent is not running, but if we just type, well, SSH add, for example, SSH add will find an environment variable. Uh, 
the, this one right here, and it'll connect to it, and it'll start sending it data. And by virtue of doing that, LaunchD will notice that because it's helping hold the IPC handle for the agent, and launch the agent on demand. So if I type SSH add, and do the quick PS again, we notice that the agent is now running. That dash L says talk to LaunchD, and now the agent's running on demand. What's great about this is that environment variable is now passed to every app within your session. So even if you're running Xcode, for example, you could just open up terminal, type SSH add, enter your keys, and then in uh, Xcode, our development environment, your SVN commits will now start using your keys. So we've got all that wired up for you. Another example is the uh, display variable. This is for X11. If we notice right now, X11 is not running. Uh, and what we do is if we run, I don't know, X logo, it's going to start up X11 on demand just by talking to the X11 port. Oh, well, I'm running a development build. I'm terribly sorry. Um, yes, 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 ignore. Um, yeah, we're not quite done yet. Um, but, uh, and for example, uh, yeah, launch CTL. Yes. Um, it helps if I type it right. All right. Um, to show you some of the examples of things being respond on demand, let me uh, take the what's it, the spotlight menu. Uh, so that's managed by LaunchD. So I'm going to CD system library launch agents. And so there's a configuration file here for Spotlight. Uh, and it's real simple. Keep Spotlight alive. And what this program corresponds to is actually a little uh, icon in the upper right-hand corner. So if we unload it, you'll notice that it's gone now. And we can reload it. Uh, and now it's back. We could also, uh, aqua, uh, so we notice that, well, 375 is the, PID 375 is spotlight. If we can kill it, launch will restart it. And, and if you looked very closely, you would have seen it blink in the upper right-hand corner. So this is an example of um, that mechanism. SSH agent demos how using IPC can launch things on demand. Uh, and I'll show you some few other things for debugging. So you can say list. These are all the jobs loaded into LaunchD. Um, this is your LaunchD too. Um, each user has their own LaunchD, and that's a part of the security that we've talked about. So there's about 68 jobs loaded up into the user's LaunchD. And if we do there's about 101 launch jobs loaded up into the system context. And this is really powerful since, of course, we're restarting things when they die. Uh, launch CTL export. Uh, so these are the environment variables that every job gets loaded up with in LaunchD. Um, some of them are vended by the jobs themselves, like SSH OSSOC and the display variable from the X11 job. And let's see. I think that's it for uh, demos. Um, of course, I could be really mean and kill all login window, and the whole session will be blown away. And login window will get restarted by LaunchD and auto log me in again. So this is what launch on demand and error recovery can do for you. It's really powerful. And I think with that, I'm going to jump back to the slides. Um, All right.
And oops. So we have some more information if you want. Um, to rehash, we have the open source website. And if you need some documentation, a lot of this was covered at WWDC, uh, our developer conference, and you can go there. And finally, let's, I thought I'd clean that slide up, but it's going to Q&A. So thanks a bunch. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, you yeah. on your own? If you start a process on your own and uh, will launch D monitor that and restart, or it will be aware only if I start the process through Launch D? Um, so Launch D only monitors processes that it knows about, so it's all that data-driven configuration files. So if you at the shell run a program, it's not going to restart it for you since. Thanks. Yeah. Um, on the right here. Um, there's a lot of cross pollination, it seems now, between Open Solaris and Mac OS X. And I was wondering if SMF is in any way influential in Launch D or if there's any cross pollination of ideas there. Um, I actually had the opportunity to run into one of the authors of SMF at a different open source conference. Mm -hmm. and we both laughed because we developed these independently and they came out about the same time a couple years ago. And so, a lot of similarities, actually. <laughs> there are, yeah, it, there are, yes. So one of the questions I had then is in terms of um, launching a job uh, through a script, uh, does the launch D know that the children launched by the scripts are to be watched and restarted or does it, have, like, how does it keep track and know when to restart that? Uh, the philosophy with LaunchD is a delegation of responsibility. So LaunchD babysits the process it launched. And however the implementer of that process wishes to solve their design, be it as a script with sub-processes or a fork and exec model with like Apache, that's up to them. And that's none of LaunchD's business. And we assert that by saying, look, we'll monitor this process. If it exits, we'll restart it. So we, don't, we didn't do what Solaris did, which was rewrite the kernel to babysit random <laughs> processes. So yeah. if it's a script and the script exits, then it would, you restart it would restart it, which may not be what you want. So you would want to probably not have the script exit. Right. Okay. It, it, we discourage, fork, and forget. Uh, is there any other question? And back with the microphone. Um, yeah, I was wondering if uh, there's some way that uh, you could specify that if a program is crashing on boot repeatedly to not continually restart it, for example, X11? Um, there is a throttle interval, and that's actually why that dialog box was coming up about every 10 seconds. Um, what surprised me, though, is that I killed X logo, so that IPC should have drained the queue because, but it didn't. Um, so that's something I can look into. But that throttle interval controls how many times per the process will be spawned. So it's not, in the default, it's 10 seconds. So it's not 10 seconds since it exited. It's the process needs to live at least 10 seconds. So if it lives three and dies, we'll throttle it for seven more seconds and then respawn it. So you won't spawn it any more frequently than 10 seconds. And you can configure that. It's just another parameter in the property list. Oh, and there is one knob to say, I believe the security server uses it on Mac OS X to say launch only once. So if it exits, launch D promises never to restart it. So on the right again. Yes. Um, when you showed the environment that's exposed, um, is that cumulative or is there a way to have like private environment variables so that I could have maybe the same process look differently in like two separate instances? Um, so if, if I understand your question correctly, um, each job can have its own list of supplemental environment variables that can either add to or override what they inherit. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to have two process, you know, two copies of X Emacs running, each one with different environment variables, you could do that with two different jobs. Anybody else? Thanks for coming.